I'm a physician at Addenbrooke's Hospital uh, and I'm also a researcher. And basically what I'm interested in is trying to understand why we like the kinds of food that we do and why our eating behavior and our weight are biologically, or how they're biologically regulated and why that's important for diseases such as obesity and diabetes. So the title really comes to try and challenge some of the views that a lot of people have. So this is what a lot of people might think about people with weight problems. That if people simply got off the sofa, did a bit more exercise and stopped eating quite as much chocolate, there wouldn't be a clinical problem with obesity and its complications. And in fact, it's amazing that since I started researching in this area just over 10, 11 years ago now, in fact, no one at that time was talking about obesity or weight problems. In fact, now a week, you know, a week doesn't even go by before you hear something in the media about weight problems. And unfortunately, you know, doctors haven't always been very sympathetic towards people with a weight problem either. In fact, we tend to see people as being somewhat of a pain. We don't really know what to do about people with weight problems. And in fact, it's a very neglected area of medicine. But in fact, being overweight is associated with significant health problems. And that's, if you like, where we come into it. Because what I'm interested in doing is helping people with medical problems. And if I want to help people with medical problems, important problems, then I need to understand more about why people gain weight. And the reason for that is this graph shows us something about diabetes. Now, many of you will know people with diabetes, and many of you will know that diabetes is becoming a huge public health problem. Okay? So by 2025, about 330 million people worldwide will have diabetes. Now, some of that, about 5%, is what's called type 1 diabetes, which is starts in children, and children usually require insulin. It can start in young adult life as well. But 95% of that diabetes on a global scale is what's called type 2 diabetes. And that's diabetes that starts later in life, usually in adulthood. And it's becoming a really major global health problem. What's interesting, if you try and look at why people develop diabetes, type 2 diabetes, there's clearly a strong genetic component. And over the last uh, year, year and a half, several of the genes that increase your risk of type 2 diabetes have been identified. But we also know that with any population, more and more people get diabetes is due to more and more people gaining weight. So somehow the act of gaining weight in a population, and you don't have to be particularly heavy, but just gaining weight increases your risk of diabetes. So we know that obesity is a major public health problem, and the figure on the left just shows you the sort of data for, for some European countries. But basically about 20% of people in the UK are clinically obese, and 50% are overweight or obese. But these graphs from the US, which I'm sure you all know has, has a major health um, concern with obesity, really graphically illustrate two things. Firstly, obesity is really common. And the second thing is that the increase in prevalence has really taken place over a very short period of time. Now, any of you who visit the US for, for holiday or for work will see that the population has really got heavier in, you know, in the last 30 years. And if you look at this data, you can see how the prevalence shown by the different colored uh, states has increased dramatically in a very short time. So this is a major problem, and it's occurred really quickly. What's interesting is that, obviously, you know, we seem to follow everything the Americans do uh, in, in many aspects, both in our politics and other things. But um, it's like a political comment there for me. Um, and we are also gaining weight as a nation. In fact, probably we're um, you know, pretty close behind the US by about 10 or 11 years behind. So in terms of our prevalences, uh, it's pretty similar. Uh, and we tend to sort of not have a great deal in common with some of our European colleagues in this regard. So one of the things that's interesting is that everyone sort of tends to assume, and certainly you know, if you look at our media, you'd think that this is the case, that everybody's getting heavier. In fact, that's not the case. What you see are some different kind of trends. So firstly, if you look at the previous pattern in the blue compared to the current pattern in the red, what you see is that over the last 30 years, the average or the mean has shifted to the right. Okay? So your average person is heavier now than they were, say, 30 years ago. Okay? That kind of makes sense if you look at both children and adults People are heavier now on average than they used to be. 
But what's also interesting is that there's a greater proportion of people with severe obesity. So this is the top end of the spectrum. There have always been people in any population who are particularly heavy. Okay? In fact, what we're now seeing is that there are more and more people who are at the really severely obese end of the spectrum. And these are the patients who are coming to see me in the clinic, and these are the patients for whom we're trying to understand the cause of their obesity. What's interesting, though, is if you look at the change in the average BMI of the population, this is the body mass index, which is a, a way of measuring fatness, if you like. Because if we just take weight, of course, the weight of somebody who's five foot tall versus the weight of someone who's six foot tall will be quite different. So what we do is we express weight in kilograms over height in meters squared, and that gives us a figure, a BMI. So we know that the BMI has changed in the UK over the last 30 years, but what actually causes that is quite shocking. Okay, you kind of imagine that must be everybody's overeating and everybody's not doing any exercise, but in fact it's not quite as simple as that. If you eat seven calories a day, more than you burn, okay, and you do that over 30 years, that's enough to lead to an increase of 10 kilos in body weight, that's enough to lead to a change in your BMI of three units, and that's enough to explain the change in the UK population over the last 30 years. So that's pretty shocking, actually, because seven calories a day is, you know, half a slice of cucumber. Now, you know, some of us think that when we look at a piece of cucumber, we start to gain weight, and there are other people who can eat what they like and they don't gain weight. But this is, I think, quite an important principle, because it's about applying maths and biology to understanding what happens. And, in fact... This is what has happened. There's a subtle change in the population. And you can imagine it's really easy to eat a few calories extra. You know, for those of us who try and occasionally watch our calorie intake, it's astonishing how easy it is. You know, if you happen to buy a cheese sandwich from Asda, and then you might buy a Taste the Difference cheese sandwich from Sainsbury's the other day, okay? you can have 150, 200 calories difference in a single cheese a packet of cheese sandwiches. You know, so seven calories a day is incredibly easy to do. And this is actually coming to, to the root of the problem, is that, in fact, it's a subtle change over a period of time that's occurred in the population. So what causes obesity? You know, why are we driven to this kind of um, tendency to develop weight gain? Well, some people would say, well, look, clearly, okay, it might be seven calories a day, but, you know, it's up to you what you eat, it's up to you how much activity you do, and... Really, it's an individual's lifestyle choice. And then if you're obese, then clearly, you know, it's your fault. So then there are some of us who are a bit more liberal-minded, I think, and might say, well, you know, look at our environment. It's changed a lot in 30 years. We have food available all the time. It's very cheap, apart from in Cambridge. Um, it's very easy to get hold of. And, you know, we don't do as much physical activity as we used to do. You know, we, we drive everywhere. We don't have to... Um, farm, we don't have to undertake, you know, a lot of physical activity at work or in the home, and clearly our environment has changed, and that's pretty obvious, it's changed in 30 years. So if that's the case, then maybe it's society's fault that we're gaining weight. Then there's a few of us who are probably known as slightly the sort of lunatic fringe, who think that actually, if you look at the evidence, it might suggest that how much weight you gain is strongly determined by genetic factors. And if that's the case, well, in fact, it's pretty obvious it must be your parents' fault. So what is the evidence that genes might play a role? Well, it would make a lot of biological sense, okay? Because clearly, it would be quite useful to have genes that allowed you to store extra energy as fat. Okay? Because obviously, you know, if you were the sort of um, <laughs> primitive man shown on the left over there, then, you know... If there wasn't much food around, if there was a famine, and you had extra calories, or you had some genes that allowed you to store extra energy as fat, or genes that told you to switch on your drive to eat and go and look for food, you'd be the person that survived. So those genes would actually be really beneficial and are likely to be selected. Of course, what now happens is, as shown by the image on the right, you know, we don't really need those genes anymore. You know, we're not dependent upon that drive to eat for our survival. And those genes, it's likely in the modern environment, are pushing us towards gaining weight. So we know that gaining weight is bad for you. We know that if you gain weight, almost regardless of what your weight is, just the process of gaining weight means you have an increased risk of diabetes, high blood pressure, even some types of cancer are more common in overweight people. 
But we also know that if you take a population and you follow people over long periods of time, most people maintain a pretty steady body weight. Okay? Some people are particularly susceptible to gain weight, but many people are not. So this really suggests that there are differences in how you respond to the environment and how you gain weight. And those differences are largely down to your genes. And the effect is actually quite strong. Okay? So if we take any two people in this room and look at the differences in their adult body mass index or their weight, okay, 40 to 70% of that difference is down to your genes. So whether you're thin, whether you're normal weight, whether you're overweight, whether you're obese, there's a strong genetic determination of your weight. So the question is, how do we know that? You know, how do we prove that that's down to genes? Okay. Well, there's some very nice studies that have been done over many years. And one of the best ways to look at the effect of genes, of course, is to look in twins. Okay. So if you take identical twins, who even if they're separated at birth and live in completely different environments, they have like a 90% identical body weight as adults. Now, our Scandinavian friends, of course, keep superb records. And one of the things that they have shown is that if you look at children who were adopted at a very young age, they have a body weight that's very similar to their biological parents and rather different from their adoptive parents with whom they share the childhood environment. So there's very strong evidence that genes play a role in your weight. And kind of people know that anecdotally. So, you know... Some people might say, oh, I'm really thin, but then everyone in my family is like that. Some people might say, okay, well, you know, I've got a real tendency to gain weight, but a lot of people in my family have that. This tendency to gain weight, or in fact to remain lean, are strongly inherited. So what we've been trying to do is to say, well, how are we going to find those genes? Because if we can find the genes and the pathways in the body for controlling weight, maybe we can identify people who are more likely to gain weight, and when people do have these problems, maybe we can find some ways to help them. Because I think until we understand why people gain weight, we're not really going to be in a very good position to help them. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about some of the research that we've been doing. And what we decided to do was to try and look at patients of ours with severe obesity. Okay? And this was supposed to be a little project for my PhD a few years ago, um, and I'm still here, and the project's now huge. And what we started to do was to say maybe we should look to see if some particular people have a problem with a certain gene. And we thought, okay, well, what would that do? Well, if it was a gene controlling your weight and that gene wasn't working, then maybe it would make you really overweight, okay, or severely obese. And we thought, well, okay, if it was a gene, of course, you've inherited that. Presumably, you'd have that tendency from a really early age. So maybe we should look at children who are really heavy from a young age and see if a problem in a gene might be causing that obesity. And we've worked very closely with doctors from around the UK, in fact, around the world, to coordinate these studies. But the question is, how do we know where to look? Okay, how do we know which genes are going to be important? And, you know, it's a pretty good guess that it's probably going to be in the brain. Okay. In fact, this just about produces, but basically, you know, when I, when I was at medical school, we didn't learn anything about the regulation of weight. Hardly any of this was known about this has really happened in about the last 15 years. And we now know, if you like, that we have a system for controlling our weight, which kind of makes sense because, you know, you can eat a lot one day, you can eat very little the next day, but somehow your body finds a way of controlling your weight and of linking what you eat with how many calories you burn. And this, that system is really centered on the brain, okay? And it's a particular part of the brain called the hypothalamus. And this is a part of the brain that controls things like sleep, controls your body rhythms, controls your hormonal output, controls stress and um, reproduction and many other processes. So the hypothalamus controls your weight through a number of ways. And what happens is you get a signal about your fat. Okay? So your fat is actually doing some very important things. Okay? I'm glad, quite glad about that. But basically, it's not just there to store extra calories. Okay? It's pretty useful that it stores extra calories. But also, it actually makes hormones. It actually makes chemicals that are released into the bloodstream and act in the brain. And they tell you how much fat you have. Okay? And one of these key hormones was the hormone leptin. And this was discovered in 1994 um, by Jeffrey Friedman in New York. And obviously, when this was first discovered, it was a bit like a kind of watershed event. It's one of those major findings in biology because this was the first evidence that your fat can make a hormone that signals to the brain and tells you how much fat you have. 
The brain also gets other signals because, of course, you know, we need to know what our weight is doing over long periods of time, but we also get a signal that we've just eaten, we get a signal that we're full, and those signals come from the gut, from your stomach, from your intestines, and they can be hormones or they can be triggered by nerves. But we also know that if you like, you can have a system that controls your weight, but then how come you can override that system? Because otherwise you could just kind of walk around quite happily and you'd eat the right amount and you'd burn up the right amount of calories and you'd never gain any weight and life would be perfect. But in fact, it's not quite as simple as that. And that's represented by this chocolate cake at the top here, is that sometimes, you know, you see a nice piece of chocolate cake and some of you probably recognize what I'm talking about here. You know, you can override those signals. You, know, you can say, yeah, I know I'm full, but I quite like that cake. Okay? So that's also quite interesting. So this is really how we got into this. And we got into this by studying some children who were really, really heavy from a young age. And um, the girl on the left here was um, eight years old and weighed 86 kilos or 14 and a half stone. And this is her cousin who was two years old and weighed 29 kilos or four and a half stone. So these children had severe obesity. Now, what is amazing is that these children had seen about 10 specialists, I think, before we met them, uh, all of whom had said, there's no obvious medical problem here. You know, we check the routine things that we know of, but clearly, you know, this is simple obesity. Now, I would say to you, when you see kids of this size, you know, that is not simple obesity because the other siblings of these children were running around, skinny little things, you know, you can't get them to eat anything. They're absolutely skinny, and yet there are these two children who were so big. And what we found is that there was a problem in these kids. It just hadn't been worked through or diagnosed before. And the problem was they were lacking the hormone leptin. So I told you that the hormone leptin is made by your fat. Okay? So what is it actually doing there? Well, actually, it's a signal telling you how much fat you have. And its probably role in the body is it's a signal for starvation. Okay? So if you don't eat anything for five days... Okay, if you've got a crash diet, you don't eat anything in five days, your leptin levels in the blood will fall by half. Okay? And you can imagine how hungry you're going to be if you don't eat anything after five days. That fall in leptin is a trigger telling you, I better eat. Okay? I'm starving. I'd better eat. And you will go looking for food. Now, any of those of you who have been on a diet, okay, and especially those kind of severe diets where you're eating like cabbages or something really extreme like that, you know that after several days of that diet, okay, so a few of you recognize what I'm talking about, a few days after that diet, okay, you're going to want anything. Okay? A carrot might seem quite appealing to you after that. And that drive to eat is triggered by the fall in leptin. So here we had some kids who we thought should have high levels of leptin because they've got plenty of fat, okay? they're overweight, and they should make plenty of leptin. But in fact, they had zero leptin, undetectable levels of leptin. And the reason they have undetectable levels of leptin is that the gene that makes leptin was not working properly. So they had a defect in that gene. So essentially, these kids, even though they're really heavy, think they're going to starve to death. They think that actually, if they don't eat something right now, they are going to die. Because that is severe starvation as far as they're concerned. So what, you know, we had absolutely no idea what does this mean for these kids. You know, we discovered this for the first time. So, okay, well, actually the simplest way to do this, and I always like to teach my, my students, is you know, just go and listen to people. Let them do the talking. You know, I don't have to come up with anything fancy here. And when I talk to the mothers of these kids and they tell me, okay, there's something wrong with these two. Okay, they're completely different to my other children. Okay? And what they're doing is they're eating all the time, or they want to eat all the time. They are driven to eat, and they'll eat any kind of food. Okay? So, in fact, one of the first things I noticed with the little chap on the right there is when I went to see him, he was always asking for food. And his mother would give him rye vita. So you know that really plain kind of crisp bread? And she'd give him rye vita. And he'd take the rye vita and go, mm, yum, yum, yum. And I was like, oh, my God. This is a pathological feature here. This is something very abnormal. There's a, a two-year-old that likes rye vita. I mean, gosh, there's, you, know, you don't have to be a, a scientist to work that out. So these kids were incredibly driven to eat. And they'd eat any kind of food to satisfy this appetite. They also had a number of other problems in that they won't go through puberty, and also they have a lot of infections. So the question is, can we do anything about it? And we were very lucky that synthetic human leptin was available. And so we said, okay, if the problem in these kids, they're missing the hormone leptin, can we treat them? And this is the same child on the left before and after treatment with leptin. So this is pretty dramatic stuff. So you can see on the left there, at the age of three, he was weighing 39, 40 kilos, 
severely obese, and now you know completely normal. So if you're lacking leptin and you can replace that leptin, it can make an incredible difference. And you can imagine the difference to the quality of life for these kids. At a very young age, their mothers can't even pick them up. They're so heavy. And yet, when we treat them, you can completely transform things. So this, for me, is one of the reasons to do science. You know, this is what science is about. You can discover something, and that discovery can lead to something that, that directly helps people. So we were very lucky to be able to do this, and we've now treated a number of these kids for over 10 years now with very good effect. So we learned quite a lot of things along the way. So the, this is just some, a graph, but it's probably better if I just describe it to you. One of the things he said, get, what on earth is, I had no idea. What's going to happen when I give this first injection of leptin? Never been done before. Okay, obviously, I just stood there and watched the kids the whole time. Okay, I had to play a lot of games, had to follow them around, do whatever, because I had absolutely no idea what it's going to do. Okay? And actually, what it did was four or five days later, there was a massive change in their eating behavior. Okay? So I told you that beforehand, they eat everything. Okay? And we suddenly noticed that they now started eating normally. They would turn away food. In fact, the first time they said no to food, the mother burst into tears. She came and found me. She'd never heard them say no to food before. Okay. So, of course, you know, being a scientist, you think, oh, God, I better measure something. I better have some data. I can't just say, look, they're now eating normally. You know, I have to have something to measure. So what we said is, okay, we need, there is no test that exists to measure this, so I'm going to make up my own test. And my own test is quite simple. Provide them with an awful lot of food, see how much food they want to eat, and do it at various time points. So when we did that, you can see in the black bars that actually when we give these kids a lot of food, this is the top panel, what you find is that they really like to eat a lot of food. So basically after they've had nothing to eat or drink overnight, we bring in a lot of food, about 5,000 calories, okay, which is pretty good if you're two or three years old. Okay? And we bring in this huge amount of food and we lay it all out and we just say what do the kids naturally want to do. And they want to eat quite a lot of food. In fact, they eat about five times as much as a normal child. Okay. What we then do, obviously, is treat them with leptin and say, OK, what happens now? And actually, there's about an 80% reduction in the amount of food they eat. They really just eat you know, a Weetabix, a bit of juice, and then they stop. So it's amazing how that drive to eat is so tightly controlled by leptin. So. We've been doing these studies for a number of years, and, and, and recently we've found quite a few other patients. And we thought maybe these patients can teach us about what's happening in the rest of us. Okay? Maybe they can tell us something about how we eat, why we like certain types of food. And you know, maybe we should revisit this phenomenon of eating Rivita. You know, it's really weird. So this is a personal crusade against Rivita on my part. Okay. So we know that you have this long-term system for controlling your weight, and it seems to, over a period of time, control how you eat and the kind of things you eat. That is one of the reasons why certain people will have um, a tendency to overeat. Okay? But we also know that you can have that system, but you can also override it. Okay? So if something's particularly tasty, smells particularly good, if it's a particular food you know, really palatable, you can override that system for controlling your weight. And we also know that sometimes things are really rewarding. You know, they really hit the spot. You feel very excited by eating certain types of food. And we know that that phenomenon of reward is encoded in certain parts of the brain. And those are the sort of pleasure centers of the brain, as they're often called. And those are also the centers that are triggered by alcohol, by smoking, by various drugs, that trigger these parts of the brain that make you feel happy. So the question is, how do you look at the human brain? You know, how do you know what's happening in someone's brain? Well, we have some pretty cool tools for that now. And one of the things that we can do is something called functional MRI. In fact, I think it was in the Times last week, uh, as well, if anyone saw it. Basically, an MRI scanner, some of you will have heard of, it's like a brain, you know, it's a brain scan. Okay? And you get a sort of picture like on the bottom left there. You get anatomy. Okay? But as well as anatomy, you can also get function. And the function is you can actually see, using the sort of red blob shown here, parts of the brain that light up when you do something. So people in Cambridge who are researching into dementia, for example, will use this technique, will have people lying in a scanner and give them like memory tasks. And certain parts of the brain will light up when you're having to remember certain things. So what you can really do with this technology is in real time, see the parts of the brain that light up when you're doing something. Okay? So if it's emotion you're studying, 
It could be seeing sad faces, seeing happy faces. Key parts of the brain light up. And you can see it literally as it's happening. What's really interesting is you can even see like two millimeters of the brain lighting up specifically. So we wanted to say, okay, well, can we look at what's happening in the brain and how the brain responds to food? Okay. So obviously, you know, you have to set up an experiment. And I had to kind of make this up. And I thought, okay, well, let's see what happens when you see pictures of food and you're lying in a scanner and there's a little screen above your head and maybe you see pictures of food and then sometimes you see uh, not food. Okay, and that's going to be a car or a tree or a chair. And literally, we actually go and went and found all these pictures and we put them all together. And we said, okay, well, how does your brain respond to these pictures? And then is it different if you're, if you're lacking leptin? Um, and then what happens when you treat patients with leptin? And then we, what happens in control subjects, in normal people, when you've had nothing to eat, and what happens when you've eaten something? Because that would kind of fit with leptin. And does your brain behave differently depending on the type of food, the type of picture? So, you know, we said, what happens if you see appetizing food, like that really nice burger over there? And what happens if you see some sort of bland food, like broccoli? And obviously there's a slight personal bias comes into the choice of the pictures. So what we did is we took a, some of these leptin deficient patients and they were in the scanner and they're having a picture of the brain and above them is a screen where we're showing these pictures in completely random order. And then afterwards we analyze it and say what happens in the brain. And what we see just on the left here is that when the kids are lacking leptin before their treatment, I told you they're really hungry, they like any kind of food, okay? The Rivita effect. All these parts of the brain, the reward centers, massively light up. Okay. Basically, anything that's food triggers all these centers. doesn't matter what kind of food it is. And then after they've had some treatment, that goes massively down. So we also said, okay, well, you know, I've seen this Rivita effect. Again, I need some data. I need some sort of measurements to see what will happen with leptin. So what we said was, okay, well, when we showed them the pictures outside of the scanner, what do they, how do they rate the pictures? So on the top left, is what happens in the leptin deficient state. When the kids have no leptin on board, they're really hungry, they really rate the cake very highly, but they also rate cauliflower very highly. Okay? It's a highly abnormal thing to do. And then, amazingly, we treat them with a week of leptin. Okay? They haven't lost any weight yet, but we know the leptin's working. Okay? They eat less. And now they think the cake's quite nice, but amazingly, they can tell the cauliflower's completely bland. Okay? Their score for the cauliflower's completely changed. And what's interesting is that this response is specific to food. Okay? So you know I told you we had other pictures. We had cars and all this kind of stuff. So in the leptin deficient state, when they like everything, all food they like, okay? but they can still tell between a BMW and a, and a Mini. You know, they can make, tell the difference. So they can discriminate from a nice car and a not so nice car, but every kind of food looks wonderful. So there's something about leptin being able to control how rewarding the food seems to be. So, I mean, perhaps don't worry about some of the, the details here, but what we've actually narrowed it down to is the key part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. It's like a, shaped like a shell, which seems to be a really key point for determining your liking of food. Okay? And the response that we saw in our patients, if you like, is an exaggerated version of what happens in all of us. So if I took any people in this room and I said, okay, don't eat anything. Okay, I make you fast. Okay, just even overnight. Just don't have anything after 10 o'clock. And then in the first thing in the morning, I put you in the scanner. Okay, and I put you in the scanner and I show you the pictures of food. Okay, what you'll find is that when I do this experiment and you're fasted, okay, food seems pretty appetizing to you because you're pretty hungry. Okay, and your brain lights up, particularly in the accumbens. If I do the same thing and you've just eaten a meal, you know, it doesn't light up quite so much. Okay. And then if, I, if you're fasted and I put you in the scanner and I show you broccoli, broccoli, cauliflower, broccoli, it lights up a bit but not very much. If I show you chocolate cake, chocolate cake, chocolate cake, okay, it lights up a lot. And almost as a direct relationship, the amount of activation in that area correlates very tightly with how you rate those foods. So what this means is that the liking of food, which we just think is a, you know, an individual thing, a choice, a behavior, is biologically encoded in this part of the brain. Okay? Which means probably that certain people really like food. Okay? And those differences between us are strongly determined by genes. They're also determined by other factors.
And clearly one of the challenges for us is trying to work out, okay, well, if you really like food and it's tightly controlled by these hormones, how else can it be controlled by things like advertising, by smell, by taste, by other types of behavior? And that's some of the stuff that we're doing at the moment. So just moving downstream of leptin, okay, just to give you a feel for where this whole sort of science is going, is that we know leptin is really important. It's one of the major factors controlling your weight. Okay? But what leptin actually does is it triggers a whole chain reaction in the brain. So basically, when you get to the brain, there are a whole bunch of nerve cells that control your appetite. Leptin triggers those. In fact, you've got some pathways in your brain that can tell you to eat more, and there are pathways in the brain that tell you to eat less. And the balance between those pathways determines what you eat. And we now know that if you have a genetic problem, a defect, in the pathways that tell you to normally eat more, sorry, to eat less, you won't eat less, i.e. you'll eat more, and you'll gain weight. Of course, what we don't know yet, and we're going to look into, is that if there's another pathway telling you um, that you should eat more, and you have a problem in that pathway, you may, of course, remain thin. So just to give you another little example of some of the work that we can do, we have um, other patients in whom we found defects in genes. Now this little chap on the left here is the world's first patient with a defect in the MC4 gene. Okay? And uh, this is one of the ones we found after leptin. I must say, you know, he, according to his medical records, he was pretty heavy. His weight was off the normal charts that we use for children. Okay? When I went to see him, I wasn't really that impressed. He doesn't really look that big. You have to be pretty big to impress me. Um, I thought, gosh, this is a bit strange, you know. Maybe they've got it wrong. But, you know, I weighed him, and sure enough, his weight was way off the chart. And then afterwards, I realized that there's a reason for that. And a lot of the patients with this gene defect look like him. Okay? His father had the same gene defect, and he was tall and quite stocky, quite big-boned. Okay? And, in fact, he worked as a bouncer in a nightclub. He'd taken on a job that fitted his genetic condition. So these kids look quite different from the leptin kids, and they look quite big-boned, and that's because when we analyze the body, they have extra fat, but also <coughs> extra muscle mass and increased bone density. Okay. So this is quite different, and this is just telling us about another pathway. And what we can do now is we've got a lot of patients with this gene problem. In fact, it's the commonest one of them all. In fact, one in a hundred people who are overweight will have this gene problem. And it's one of the commonest genetic diseases, if not the commonest, in the UK population. So some of you may, for example, have heard of cystic fibrosis. It's you know, something that we, many of us hear about, we're certainly taught about. This is five times more common, okay, at least five times more common. So a lot of people don't know they have an MC4 gene problem. They just think they're big. They've always been big. And one of the things that we can do, shown by the right-hand panel, is that we can look at this gene and see how it affects the receptor. And often it twists it in funny ways, and we can model that. And we are now trying to work with other companies to develop drugs that might be able to, to rectify this. Okay, so this was just another message, actually. This is some of you will recognize as Cartman from South Park. This is a rather famous character who's always said, I'm not fat, I'm big boned. And in fact, I think he's probably right. He may well have an MC4 gene defect. Um, I've asked for a sample of his DNA, so we can check that out. Um, but it does show you that some of those kind of myths, some of the things that people say, actually may well have a basis in science. And the science is about just trying to understand things we don't know much about. And obesity and weight problems, if you like, are almost in a way the ultimate, because people for a long time haven't even wanted to believe that there could be a biological basis for these things. So I'm just going to really wrap up and leave some time for questions just by saying I've talked a little bit about leptin. It's a hormone that comes from your fat, and it is a key regulator of how much you eat and your weight over long periods of time. It also links your weight with things like reproduction and fertility, and also with the immune system. So we know, for example, that children who are malnourished okay, um, get a lot of infections, and that's probably down to leptin. We also know that as the population is getting heavier, children are going into puberty and developing at an earlier stage. That's probably also related to leptin. As you make more fat, you make more leptin, it probably triggers puberty at an earlier stage. We know that leptin in the brain triggers this kind of chain reaction, and one of the key genes is MC4, and that's pretty common in the population. And 
I think one of the important things about this kind of work is it shows us that in certain patients, particularly who are severely obese, a defect in like a single gene can actually cause that obesity. And in some cases, like with leptin, it can be treated. What's interesting is that all these genes converge on the regulation of appetite. So the problem for these patients is that they overeat, they are hungry, they like food. So it shows us that that process, which we all have, okay, is biologically controlled by these molecules and pathways in the brain. And why is this stuff important? Well, I think it's important, firstly, for our patients. Okay, that's why I do the work that I do. And these are some of my patients. I don't know if you can quite read it, but they've actually had T-shirts made which say, I'm not fat, it's in my genes. Um, they call themselves the Bristol MC4s. And they had these T-shirts made because actually they'd all had problems from an early stage with their weight and with a lot of people telling them you know, that they're eating far too much, that, there's, um, that they're not really trying to lose weight. The adults, people have been kept in hospital forcibly to try and make them lose weight. And many of you will have heard stories in the press about children being taken into care because their obesity is thought to be down to their parents deliberately overfeeding them. So it's interesting that what started off as, as research for us has now had a, quite a different angle. In fact, I find myself um, involved in some of these kind of um, discussions and disputes for various patients. And this is one of the things that I really hope that we can start to try and challenge is that you may remember a couple of years ago these kinds of headlines, and they come across from time to time, um, really about basically um, chastising the family of a three-year-old child who died from severe obesity. And I must say, I was particularly horrified about this because actually it was used by the media and in fact by the government because of the Department of Health white paper as a way of saying, my goodness, look at the state of the nation. Even three-year-olds are dying from obesity. Uh, three-year-olds only die from severe obesity if there's something wrong with them. Okay. And this, in fact, was a patient of mine who actually had a genetic defect that I haven't talked about. And yet, people just completely ignored that and used the child's case to highlight the issue of obesity without actually talking to the parents who read it in the paper uh, without having been asked. So it shows, really, that there's a real negative attitude towards obesity and obese patients and a real willingness to try and use, if you like, it's almost like the sort of last bastion of you can actually blame people for their obesity. You don't really blame people for, for being a little bit um, uh, promiscuous. We don't blame people for having epilepsy anymore. We used to do that, do that in the Middle Ages. But we can blame people for being severely obese. And I just hope if one of the things that we manage to achieve is to try and change some of those things, then we'll have done something. So I'm just going to leave you with my little message that clearly, obviously, we should all try and eat a little bit less and we should exercise a bit more. But if we can try and understand a bit more about our DNA, that would probably be quite a good thing. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.